from the Department of Communication in Phillipsburg. This is a special edition of Inside Government with Cedric Peterson. To our audience here at home and around the world, you are now Inside Government. We welcome you to the program. In this edition of the program, in preparation for the parliamentary elections that's taking place January 11th, 2024, our guest in this edition of the program is Chairman of the Electoral Council of St. Martin, Attorney at Law, Mr. Richard Gibson, Jr. Mr. Gibson, it's great to have you as a first-time guest in the program. Thank you so much for joining me. Good day, Mr. Peterson. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me and, and yeah, giving us the opportunity to enlighten the public about the functioning of the, um, the Electoral Council. It's great to have you. Just want to get right into it. Not much time, so we're just going to jump right into our questions that we've prepared Uh, Can you provide an overview of the role and responsibilities of the Electoral Council of St. Martin? Sure. Um, The role of the Electoral Council is primarily uh, to uh, register political parties, make decisions on their request uh, for registration, and also to um, supervise the reporting of um, the political parties on their finances. Um, the idea behind the law is to I- enforce as much as possible an, an integral uh, political um, um, functioning of the political parties on, on St. Martin and to avoid as much as possible conflict of interest situations by you know, capping the amount of donations that political parties and political candidates uh, receive on an annual basis. And we're going to get more in depth in regard to the process and procedures and making sure that they're accurate. Um, Who are the appointed members of the Electoral Council and and who's responsible for appointing those members to the council? Well, the council consists of um, uh, three members, um, myself as the, the chairman of the council. And then we have uh, Mrs. Uh, Nerissa De La Rosa as a vice chairperson and Sandy, Sandy Ford as treasurer uh, of the council. In addition, we also have um, two uh, substitute members, um, y- Yvette Franca and Mr. Ahmed Bell as substitute members. So in the event, uh, you know, one of the members are not available, they can always um, sit in for any of the members that are not available for particular meetings. Okay. And who's, rem- and, and like I indicated, who, who is responsible for appointing the members to the council? Well, the members, they are appointed by, by national decree, um, signed by, by the governor. So in essence, uh, appointed by the governor and and the minister. So in in a nutshell, the government um, and the members are are appointed upon the the recommendation of an appointment um, committee um, consisting of um, uh, the president of the um, Common Court of Justice, the vice chairman of the Council of State and the chairman of the uh, Audit uh, General Chamber. Uh, so that's in a nutshell the process for the appointment of the, uh, the members of the council. So what criteria and requirements must political parties meet um, in order to be able to be eligible for registration with the Electoral Council? Well, um, First of all, it's important that the party um, organize itself as an, a formal association. Um, so that means you would have to go to a notary and request a notary to draft articles of incorporation for the, um, the association. And uh, the reason why that is a, a requirement is because legally associations um, um, have members, uh, voting members. So it's also to encourage the democratic process within the political parties themselves with um, voting members. Um, there are also some requirements 
that are stipulated um, in the law, in particular in Article 15 on the ordinance on the registration and finance, financing of political parties. There are about 16 requirements and some quite obvious, such as, you know, the name of the, the foundation of the association and the purpose of the association. But I think it's important to highlight um, the, the, the crucial requirements as it relates particularly to, to voting and, and elections. Um, the articles must contain a, a provision um, limiting the voting rights of members to members that are eligible to vote in the um, general uh, elections. Um, also, an important requirement that must be incorporated in the Articles of Incorporation of the political party is the requirement to publish their manifestos prior to the election. So that has to be incorporated in the Articles of Incorporation. And there must also be a procedure to establish the candidates that will um, take part in the um, parliamentary uh, elections. Um, and to register with the council, um, it is important that the request must be submitted to the electoral council in writing. Um, and also along with that request, a, uh, the aspiring political party must also indicate who will be the party representative. So that would be the person who would correspond between the Electoral Council and the political uh, um, party. And along with the registration, the party must also submit the party reference, the desired party reference. So in other words, the reference of the party on top of the, um, the um, voting ballot, so to speak. Those are, in a nutshell, the, um, the requirements. Okay. So the timeline involved in the registration process for political parties leading up to the parliamentary elections. Explain what is the timeline itself? Um, well, as has been uh, mentioned in the media, the uh, date for the upcoming elections is uh, January 11th of next year, so 2024. 20, um, um, and as I understand it, postulation date has been scheduled for November 22nd of this year. And the law states that uh, if a political party wishes to participate in the upcoming elections, that they must submit their registration um, at least six weeks before postulation date. And that is not uh, specific to these upcoming elections, but that is just general for any upcoming elections that they must register or at least submit their registration six weeks before um, postulation date. So we have made a, a, a little calculation and um, six weeks prior to postulation date brings us to October 11th of this year. So to be very concrete, any uh, political party that wishes to take part in the upcoming elections, they should have their registration in by October 11th of this year. Mr. Gibson, Explain, especially to our younger audience, um, who are so technically inclined these days, uh, what role does technology play in the registration and finances of political parties? Um, well, yeah, the Electoral Council uh, tries to um, remain current as much as it can with, <laughs> with the current uh, technological uh, possibilities that we have at our disposal. Um, for example, we have just um, um, uh, put in the air a new website. It's not the most um, sexy website, but we <laughs> consider it to be our priority to at least have a functioning website uh, in the air, also in relation to the um, upcoming um, elections, so that you know the public can be properly um, informed. But also with regards to the the political parties and reporting, we try to make it as as easy as possible by also providing the possibility of, um, of sub submitting the financial reports and the donation reports uh, via our website uh, 
online. So we try to keep up as much as possible from that point of view. And of course, you know, with the possibility of having um, online meetings, um, we intend to make use of that, but we haven't really had the, um, the need to do that as yet. But for emergency situations, of course, we will have um, online meetings um, when necessary. But we prefer face-to-face -face meetings because the interaction is a little different than online meetings. Yeah, there's there's a little bit of a dynamic there, of course, face to face. So it's totally understandable. But it's great to see that um, the Electoral Council is utilizing today's technologies. And of course, to our viewing and listening audience, be sure to check out their website for more information, especially if you're interested in, in registering yourself or uh, your political party uh, with the Electoral Council, be sure to visit their website. Um, how does the Electoral Council, because we can't do this alone. That's That's one of the key things about this brand new democracy that we've built since 2010 is that um, no institution can, uh, you know, grow St. Martin by themselves. They will have to collaborate with other institutions. So how does the Electoral Council um, cooperate with other institutions to ensure safe and fair elections? Right. So str strictly speaking, um, the Electoral Council does not have a formal role with um, other governmental um, institutions. Um, though we communicate with the voting bureau, we have recently reached out to them and, um, you know, tried to make contact to see if we can, you know, um, assist each other in whatever aspect necessary. Um, so from that point of view, we, we, we um, cooperate with the voting bureau. Um, the only formal role um, that we have with another institution as uh, written in the law is with the um, Stichting Overheids Accountants Bureau, uh, better known as um, SOAB. Um, and they are available by law to provide us with requests with advice on the financial reports that are submitted by the uh, political parties and their, their candidates. So that's the only formal role we have with, um, with another institution. But of course, we're open to cooperate in any way we can with any institutions that would you know, facilitate democratic process integrity um, uh, with the yeah, political process on St. Martin. St. Martin, I'm having an insightful conversation with the chairman of the Electoral Council of St. Martin, Mr. Richard Gibson, Jr. Stay with us. So we're going to get into our next segment. We're going to talk about the challenges the Electoral Council might have faced over the years and how they have overcome those in preparation to help us making sure that parties are registered properly. Um, and of course, their finances are held accountable. So be sure to stay with us. More with Mr. Richard Gibson, Jr. coming up right after the break. Nervous? Embarrassed? To speak to a loved one or to your doctor? I'm never too embarrassed to talk about my prostate issue and the treatment I chose. Not being embarrassed probably even saved my life. Growing up, I have always been involved in sports. I biked a lot, but I put aside my macho behavior and had a conversation with my doctor about my prostate condition. That was saved my life. Now I'm doing this to save yours. Prostate cancer is the most common cancer among men in the United States. And because of our proximity, we in St. Martin tend to have relative findings. So I am getting my prostate checked every year. It's the one leading cause of death among men of all races, but most likely to develop in older men and black men. I'm not too embarrassed to get my prostate checked. Prostate cancer is a serious disease, and I believe that early detection is better than being too embarrassed to talk to your doctor about it or to get checked. Hey, Pops, did you get your prostate checked out? See, that wasn't difficult, right? Just start the conversation. You might save a life. It may be even your own. So what are you waiting for? Man up, check up.
Hello, everyone. If you're just tuning in, I'm having a conversation with the Electoral Council of St. Martin, shared by Mr. Richard, attorney at law, Mr. Richard Gibson, Jr. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you're just joining us, we're talking about the preparations for the parliamentary elections that's going to be taking place in 2024 and the registration and finances of political parties. Um, Mr. Gibson, I want to get into how does the Electoral Council, well, let me start off first by asking, challenges that their council might have faced over the last 2000 uh, from 2010 and its formation to now that might have come up um, that might have impacted the carrying out of the mandate of the electoral council is there any any obstacles that the council might have faced well um f- first i must um indicate that the current composition of the council did not exist at the time of the last um parliamentary elections. So the uh, current members of the council, they have not um, experienced a parliamentary election in their current role as members um, of the council. Um, however, as, as mentioned, the electoral council does not have a, a specific role with regards to the elections themselves. And that is primarily with um, with the voting bureau itself. So we are not exposed to any challenges uh, as it relates to the elections themselves. Um, But as I said before, if any issues arise and and we can be of assistance to the the voting bureau, um, we are of course, you know, open to assist in in any manner that, that we can. How does the electoral council ensure transparency and accountability in its operations and decision-making processes? Um, Well, what the Electoral Council does, it tries to publish as much as possible uh, the decisions that are made. Um, We also publish them on our our website for for the public uh, to see. Um, But also by law and with one of the most important decisions of the Electoral Council relates to decisions to admit or allow a aspiring political party to be registered. The law prescribes that the party representative of the particular political party is allowed to sit in the meetings of the council where the council deliberates on the acceptance of the registration of a political party. So from that point of view, the process is is very much um, transparent. How does the Electoral Council address concerns about the influence of money in politics and the potential for corruption? Well, that is actually the raison d'etre of the um, Electoral Council. So the, the reason for the existence of the Electoral Council um, and um, the requirement for the political parties and their candidates to register their um, donations um, um, by having them register, it would be possible for the council to um, review and see what donations are received. Um, As mentioned um, before, the amounts that the parties can receive um, have been capped by by law. Um, so it's it's capped at fifty thousand guilders per political party. Um, but fifty thousand combined, so the political party and the candidate combined. As it relates to the party alone, it's capped at uh, thirty thousand guilders, and an individual candidate, it's capped at. Uh, 20,000 guilders. So combined, that would bring you to a total of 50,000 uh, guilders. Um, so it's via the, the registration process um, that, um, that you know, the, the council tries to limit the influence of money in the political process. And that is to, you know, avoid conflict of interest situations, because if a party or a candidate receives significant amounts from a particular donor, uh, you know, the party or the candidate could feel indebted to that donor and influence also maybe possible MPs in, in their voting behavior. So, you know, that's why it's capped as much as possible. 
Mr. Gibson, can you provide examples of successful enforcement actions or initiatives taken by the Electoral Council um, to promote integrity and transparency in the registration and financial processes of political parties? Yes. So um, the current composition of of the the council as it is now, um, we have not reached to the point or escalation in situations where we would have to implement enforcement measures. We are still currently in the phase of reviewing the reports that you know candidates and the political parties have submitted thus far. And um, on the basis of what has been submitted thus far, of course, we will review. And if any of the reporting is incomplete or improper before you know um, falling back to enforcement measures, we will, of course, inform them and encourage them to supplement and, and, and you know, correct their, their reporting before we resort, um, you know, um, resort to um, enforcement measures. Because it's not primarily, you know, handing down enforcement, but it's encouraging the political parties and their candidates to report as much as possible and as accurately as possible. And only in extreme situations, I believe, we would then have to resort to enforcement uh, measures. What steps are taken by the Electoral Council um, to educate political parties and their members about the registration and financial requirements for parliamentary elections? We know you mentioned the website, but are are there any other undertakings that the Electoral Council take? Um, Yes, so number one, by accepting invitations such as this one uh, for for interviews, for which we would like to thank you once again for for giving us the opportunity to inform the public on the manner in which the Electoral Council um, functions. Um, But we do so as well as uh, via our Facebook. We have a Facebook account as well. So there we hope to reach a a broader segment um, of the, the public. And our offices are open from uh, 9 to 4, Monday to Friday. And uh, Mr. Christopher Hazel, who's our policy advisor, is uh, available to assist any members of the public that wishes to visit the offices with any information um, that they require. Um, so in a nutshell, that's, that's what we try to do as much as possible to, to inform uh, the public. Another interesting question is, is how long does it take to get a decision after the application and registration um, is completed at the council? Right. So um, once a political party has um, submitted its application, the law prescribes that the council must make a decision within three weeks after the application has been submitted. So it's, it's a fairly short period of time from which you will get a reaction from the Electoral Council. However, if the application um, turns out to be incomplete or improper, the Electoral Council would give the aspiring political party um, a period of time of one week to supplement or or correct the application. Um, Once that has been done, it has been corrected, then the Council has another three weeks to then decide on the amended application. If at that point it is not correct, then the request for registration would be denied. And so I think it's important to point out that any political party that wishes to take part in the upcoming elections, that they should not wait until the last moment um, for registration, because if it turns out that the application is not complete, and even after getting a one-week reprieve for correction and it's denied, you will be forced to then probably submit your new request after October 11th, and that will result in you not be able to take part in the um, upcoming elections. So I urge them to register as soon as possible. How frequent must donation registration be submitted to the Electoral Council, and, and what other financial reporting requirements do political parties have to adhere to? Um, the... Parties have to report on a yearly basis, um, once a year. Um, Prior to the 1st of February, they have to submit their uh, donations. Uh, The 
party has to submit all donations received, so the donations submitted to the party as well as the donations that have been submitted to the um, to the individual um, candidates. So that has to be done on a yearly basis prior to February um, 1st. Um, also, prior to April 1st, the um, parties have to submit what we call their annual reports. And in the annual report, they have to indicate who the current board members are, the amount of paying members, the amount of dues received from the members, and the activities that the political party conducted in the prior year. Um, and along with the annual reports, the political party also has to submit their financial um, reports. And in the financial reports, they would have to report their equity position at the beginning of the year and their equity position at the end of the year. So in a nutshell, they would just have to report their total assets at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. And then, you know, you can see if there are any uh, mutations from that point of view. Um, also, they have to submit a list of income and expenditures along with the declaration of an accountant with regards to the accuracy of that um, reporting. Um, and of course, the um, uh, total amount of gifts that are received does not include the dues that are paid by the regular members. That is uh, completely separate. And it's also important to add that cash gifts or donations above um, 5,000 guilders are not allowed. Any amounts above that has to be done via, you know, bank transfer. And that's also for transparency reasons. Mr. Gibson, we are running out of time, and I want to give you the opportunity to provide final words um, to the public of St. Martin, specifically political parties that's looking to come, you know, compete within the upcoming elections or elections in the future. Um, final words. You have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think it's important for me to emphasize that, and I believe for the political candidates, that as of the moment that you are designated by your political party as a candidate for the upcoming elections, that of, as of that moment, you have to start registering all donations that you have received up until election day. And then there's one other requirement I would like to emphasize is that one month after the parliamentary elections, all candidates must report the donations they have received to the Electoral Council. That's within one month after the elections. And I think I should emphasize that if they do not adhere to that time frame, that it is a criminal offense and it's threatened with uh, detention of three months or a 10,000 guilder fine. So I urge all candidates to please report on time to the Electoral Council. And generally speaking, I would like to wish the population of St. Martin safe and um, 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 enjoyable elections for this upcoming election season. Chairman of the Electoral Council of St. Martin, Attorney at Law, Richard Gibson, Jr. Mr. Gibson, thank you so much for being a part of this edition of the program. Thank you for having me. And to our radio listeners, television viewers, and online viewers, thank you for tuning in and being a part of this edition of Inside Government. If you've missed my conversation with Mr. Gibson Jr., be sure to catch video on demand at the official Facebook page of the Government of St. Martin at facebook.com forward slash SXMGOV. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel of the Government of St. Martin, youtube.com at Government of St. Martin. And for audio playback, tune in to St. Martin Gov Radio 107.9 FM throughout the course of the day. On behalf of the Electoral Council of St. Martin and all of us here at the Department of Communication, I'm Cedric Peterson. Thanks so much for tuning in.